Question of Let's Be Blunt with Montel, where we talk about everything and anything cannabis to see if we can actually give you some information, help you navigate the space out there as you're trying to make some good choices for yourself, especially when you go into dispensaries and places and you're trying to make some lifestyle or, or health-related choices. We want to make sure we give you the information that you need. And we're also talking about, you know, other issues, especially this election year. We'll be talking about issues that, that you know, you're coming in face with every single day and make sure we try to provide you with a forum where, you know, we can be blunt about issues. And, you know, today I've got a very special opportunity to, to speak with a guest who's doing something, let's call it extra blunt, uh, especially in our cannabis space in New York City. He's one of the owners of a company that's called Spleef New York City, a company that hosts curated lifestyle parties and events that incorporate edible and drinkable enhancements that include cannabinoids in them and into every experience. They're activists for the inclusion of recreational cannabis in New York State and working very, very hard to give people experiences so that they understand what it is they're talking about when they even enter a conversation about cannabis. So please welcome Mark to Let's Be Blunt. And thanks a lot, sir, for being here with me today. Oh, thank you so much, Montel. I have to say, first of all, that it is an absolute honor uh, to be meeting you here. Oh, thanks, uh, first of all, just because I've seen you on TV since I was a child, <laughs> and then to later find out that you're about this so much and have been about this for so much longer than I have been about this. And now 20, that we're, this, is, this is 20 years. Yeah, now, long, yeah. long before it became the gold or the green rush. Right, right. And I right. literally was out there in the streets and sometimes felt, you know, really kind of kind of bad about it. The fact that I was thrown out there floundering sometimes by myself back in the day when, you know, nobody would come to my you know, aid or even back me up with the fact that I started using cannabis now close to 20 years ago mm -hmm. on a daily basis because of, you know, my diagnosis with MS. Right. And consider it the medicinal agent that has been considered for now 5,000 years, mm -hmm. you know. And now all of a sudden we're starting to, I think, finally see a little light at the end of the tunnel. I think more and more people are becoming more and more accepting of cannabis. And I think it's organizations like yours, though, you know, I mean, I like your name, and, and it's Spleef New York City, yep. and people are going to look at that and go, I'm going to sleep. Instead of looking at it that way, I think to look at it from the standpoint of opening up the experience for people to destigmatize and to feel less threatened by mm -hmm. a cannabis experience. So why don't you explain exactly what you do, what your organization does? Oh man! So that um, answering that question is is always fun, uh, <laughs> and it is uh, both I and my partner Mike, who actually uh, we we both run this uh, thing together. Mm -hmm. um, we we love talking about what we do, what our story was, and um, well, quite simply, Spleef NYC is uh, it's it's a it's a lifestyle brand that does more than just one thing. I mean, we we host events. Uh, and even at the events, there's lots of things that are going on to further educate and normalize and destigmatize. Um, but it is more than that. It is the entire experience that we are bringing here. We are holding ourselves to a high standard, a standard that is now only being accepted in the adult use states mm -hmm. um, uh, because the culture has grown to a point where the state, why would there be a stigma? The state, the, 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 the local authorities are saying that it's totally okay for me to be doing this. And yet in a place like New York, that is so highly diverse of so many people with so many thought processes and mm -hmm. all of that, we still live in a in a state in a city that is in a state that uh, to this day either is not as educated or is as educated, um, but does not. They do not have the uh, the platform, the channel, the the safe space, if you will, mm -hmm. to uh, go somewhere and know that what first of all the products that they are consuming uh, are being you know, told to them, they are being educated on about what they, these products are done, doing to them, that they are locally made, locally mm -hmm. sourced here in New York. That's mm -hmm. the whole thing here. And that also with our events is to have a place where, you know, here's the whole thing, Montel, uh, you know, Mike and I are both native New Yorkers. I grew okay. up in Queens, Bron uh, Mike in the Bronx, um, 
And I, unlike Mike, have also been an avid cannabis consumer since I was 16, never looked back. Gotcha. Um, and when the culture was starting to grow here, which is only like maybe five years ago, and by the culture, I'm talking about like that it's a cool thing, that it's not just, yeah, let's just smoke up with our friends because that has always been the cool thing. Sure, but, sure. <laughs> but more than that, you know what I mean? And the only thing that was available, the first thing that I was seeing uh, was that you have what we call seshes. A sesh is an event that uh, usually is very underground. Um, they take a warehouse in some place that's very far away from like residential and mm -hmm. hard to get to. And uh, because it's, you know, it's, it's quote unquote illegal. So people are obviously trying to mitigate their risks, but they're not doing it the right. I didn't feel that they were doing it the right. These way. were like what raves, marijuana raves in a sense uh, where no. people could get together and just smoke openly well, yes, in a, in a, in a form. Yes, basically. Right? Yes. And on top of that, that it didn't market. So you would, they would bring in all of these vendors mm -hmm. um, who are local brands. And I get, the, I totally was for what they were doing, but they weren't doing it the right way okay. because they were, they were just getting all of these local business services, sir, we mm -hmm. call them, um, to vend their products that they probably just outsourced from the legal sure. states, that they're not cultivating this, that they're not building their own brand. And so what you see is that in these sessions, two things are the only two things that are happening is that everyone is smoking up. Mm -hmm. The entire place is just cloud full of smoke, which is sure. cool and all for a little while. And then you get uncomfortable. You want to leave because right. you can't even breathe. Right. And that you have all of these vendors uh, selling basically the same shit, you know what right. I mean? Everybody's got bud, everybody's got vapes, every, every single vendor has the exact same thing and none of them are representations of their brand. They're just trying to make a quick buck and they're sure. all just together to do this. So we saw that okay. as uh, these are the only events that are available for people to socialize and come together mm -hmm. in New York with cannabis. And then on the other spectrum, they started introducing infused dinners and those started popping up. Mm -hmm. So a lot of uh, chefs, professional chefs that have been in the culinary scene in New York for a long time now see a new way for them to become their own name, go, go away from the restaurant life. And I was in the restaurant life, so mm -hmm. I know how stressful it is. And I can only imagine how it is for a chef. They now have this opportunity to do their own thing with a cool thing with cannabis. And I thought that was awesome because now you have this platform for people to be sophisticated and socialize and consume cannabis in a brand new way that they right. are not smoking it necessarily. And I thought that that was really cool, but I saw a problem there too. The problem there was number one, these events were not necessarily accessible to everyone because of their price point. Sure. Um, the, your cheapest ticket to a cannabis dinner at the time that I was even seeing them was like $150 already. Gotcha. It has grown since then because of the demand and whatever. These mm -hmm. guys have grown on their own. Um, and that's all cool and all. But where does it leave everybody in between? Right. You basically have everybody who who's cool with the, doing the whole underground thing, and you know there's a there's a interest to that in to a lot of New Yorkers the, mm -hmm. that that underground vibe, you know. But then you also and then you also have the upscale. But you don't have anything in the middle, and gotcha. so that's where we came in. Mm -hmm. That's where I and Mike saw this idea that, you know. Where do people like to socialize in New York? Bars, right? Lounges. Why? Because there's free room to walk around. There's entertainment. There's lots of things to do. And mm -hmm. then you're just walking up to a bar and you're drinking something, something that you're able to consume while not having to sit down, use utensils or anything. Mm -hmm. So as we know now, Montel, cannabis can be consumed in a pretty much of, any, uh, any way. Myriad of just, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> myriad of ways. Absolutely. Myriad of ways. And one of them is drinkable, and that's a lot. That's one that a lot of people don't know about yet. Mm -hmm. um, to drink THC, you think, well, what does that mean? Does that mean you just put it into oil and then you put oil into a beverage? That doesn't sound mm -hmm. very tasty. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, we don't, because oil isn't the only way you can extract sure. THC. So it kind of started escalating from there. And, um, you know, we've been doing what we, we branded three styles of events that we do, one called Spleef Speakeasy, 
which mm-hmm. is a cocktail party, uh, and it is a true modern speakeasy. Now, by speakeasy, we don't. I'm not. I'm not thinking about 1920s, like everyone in flapper dresses listening to. Jazz. I'm talking about speakeasy. What does a speakeasy mean? It is a place where a people, private place, go, right? Where people go to consume something that is prohibited, and that you have to know what to do to get inside. That it's not for everyone. Okay. And that's exactly the concept that we had. We had mixologists create. Uh, an array of of drinks that are non-alcoholic, which is another mission of ours, that it is not just to normalize cannabis use, but it is to replace alcohol with cannabis as the new social lubricant. Gotcha. So with that, we we don't allow alcohol at all to be, not, I mean, we don't serve it, and therefore no one's going to be bringing it because it's a classy party and do you have enough to consume? So... We would have that. We would have a chef that we would partner up with making infused hors d'oeuvres, being passing it around. So there's a level of sophistication to all of these parties, okay. but they're not high brow. They're inclusive. And at the same party at this particular, the speakeasy, do mm-hmm. you get to consume in smokable or vaporable also at the same time? Correct. Okay. So the thing is that in all of our parties, be it a speakeasy or high tea that I'm about to tell you about or this new thing that we call Spleef and Chill, that... Our main thing is the drinkable form and possibly the uh, the edible form because we were originally an edible and drinkable company. Mm-hmm. So that's always there. But that we would always have a complimentary dab bar. We would always have uh, vaping being allowed. We would have a vape sponsor bring in their own gadgets and whatever and, and giving mm-hmm. that. We would have a smoking section, which is also very important. Okay. Because we, we, we're not, we don't, first of all, like with the relationship with venue owners, I mean, this is a whole nother challenge that we face mm-hmm. all the time, talking to venue owners and trying to paint the picture in their mind of what we do and them not thinking that it's a sesh, which is what people usually think of when sure. a cannabis party, everyone's smoking up. So we say, no, we don't have smoking. We'll have a smoking section if you allow us, if you have, say, a rooftop or mm-hmm. a separate room. Or, or a garden or something out back. Sure. Right. Or if it's even a ground level venue, which we've had a lot of times, people can just go right outside. And like if it's a regular bar at a bar, smokers will just go outside, smoke a cigarette, come back in. It's mm-hmm. the same thing because mm-hmm. of how normalized and, and and decriminalized it is right now. And then with the, 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 you, when you say uh, vendors or, or the, the bars yes. themselves, you reach out to just any bar in the city no, and say? No, no, no. Well, we actually don't use bars. We okay. curate our experiences. So when looking in venues, I mean, as event planners, you have to look at a space and see how it will work for you. Sure. Bars we stay away from. Okay. Um, because, you know, I mean, there's just a lot attached to bars and a lot of liability that an owner is going to have to consider. Mm-hmm. So we don't even go in that direction. Mm-hmm. We usually go for, you know, event spaces, like private event spaces, whether mm-hmm. they're uh, commercial or residential. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, we just we approach them. We tell them what we do. We now we have this long repertoire of, of media who's covered us, uh, you know, our website that shows all of the stuff that we've been doing for the last okay. two years and all that. It, it makes it a little bit easy. And, of course, the climate that we're in, the cannabis climate that we're in, everyone is interested in it. So all of these things kind of help us. Um, and, and you're a private club kind of organization where you, we it's a membership-driven thing. Is that Correct. right? Correct. Explain and, that to me. How sure. Do, yeah, membership-driven. Explain that. So as you know, we, we have to have a certain level of discretion. Uh, we cannot just be open to the public until it is, in fact, legal. So there has to be a certain level of discretion there. One way to do that is to have memberships, uh, membership registration. Um, so basically, to get access to our events, to go on our website and get tickets to our events, uh, you have to be a member. But to go on our website, you don't have to be. So you can see everything that we do, like the the next event that's coming and, mm-hmm. and what we're about. But if you want access, you have to become a member. Now, to become a member, all you have to do is just go on our website. There's a, a link to it. Uh, and you fill out a registration form. We're asking you for information about who you are, where you're at, and social media. Uh, that what, what stops me from being Detective you know, Brian Williams who fills out an application and purchases a membership, and then I show up and try to bust everybody in the place. The thing is that we, I mean, I don't think a Detective Williams would ever have, would ever willingly give us his home address, be able to prove that it's his home address, Mm -hmm. give us his social media, and be able to prove that it's his own personal page, let us into his life. No detective would do that. No, no 
authority figure would want to do that unless they specifically want to take us down. Right. And I think, Montel, that in New York, I mean, we're, we're riding the wave very nicely and that there are so many things that are going on in New York right now that I Least think, of worries. Yeah. I, I don't think that the authorities want to do this because of how the governor wants to put this in the right direction. The moment there's a bad story, the moment there's a bust, quote unquote, and the moment that, that something gets shut down, it makes us all look bad. So as long as we're not bothering anyone and people are really having a good time and no mm -hmm. one's getting hurt, there's never been an instance. As we know, marijuana doesn't do that to you. It does not make you sick. Right. The THC doesn't do that. and. And if you were sick, we don't only have THC to offer. We have CBD at all of our parties as mm -hmm. well and educate people and all of those things. For someone to want to take and close a party like this, I don't understand what the purpose of it would be. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? We're trying to build a culture here. We're pioneering a movement. We're holding ourselves to a higher standard to show New York like, no, Doing what you're doing with this seedy stuff or only being very super highly, highly private is not going to be able to spread a culture to as many people as possible. Right. You're still being exclusionary, and that's not what we're about. What, what kind of numbers are we talking about when people show up at events? What is it? So, 50, 100? So, yeah. So, I was going into, like, the different styles of events sure. that we have, right? So, on a seasonal basis, we have speakeasy, we have high tea, and now we're launching Spleef and Chill. Speakeasy would come in, it's on a weekend, so it's a weekend party on a bigger space. We would look around 100, 125 guests. Mm -hmm. High tea is more of an after uh, a um, happy hour crowd, right? So it's after work on a weekday, around 40 to 50, sometimes 60 guests. And then spleef and chill, which is uh, now high tea is, is a tea party. So imagine instead of a cocktail party, it's more intimate and cozy and in a different environment where instead of a live performance of a big band, you have like an acoustic set instead of a live art piece that's like a sculpture or a body paint. You have like just a, a nice. So it's like a smaller, cozier version okay. of speakeasy. Mm -hmm. And then spleef and chill uh, it's just a lounge session, you know, like we don't bring any vendors. We don't bring any entertainers. This is just something that you just come. And people out. can socialize together exactly. in the culture of cannabis. Correct. Now, mm -hmm. cannabis consumption is always there, even in Spleef and Chill. And, uh, the idea there is that we would serve THC seltzers from a, from a tap, from a keg, gotcha. uh, right here. Here you go. You know what I mean? And this is blowing people's minds because you're walking up to a bar type of style environment and you got a guy with a tap and everything, and they're pouring you a is this PC a, beverage. Is this a pay-as-you-go, or the membership pays? So it's uh, the way it is now is that our memberships are free, but that's about to change as we're upgrading into the next year. Uh, they will still be very affordable, and mm -hmm. it would be on a month uh, monthly subscription basis. But to um, get access to our events, you just buy a ticket. You go, uh -huh. get a ticket, and when you get a ticket, it's pretty much all inclusive. Okay, gotcha. Um, the vendors, you know, we would always have a vendor marketplace mm -hmm. as part of it, just like we would have a smoking section as part of it, but not the whole thing. So vendors, you know, you have a shopping experience, whatever the vendors are selling there, you know, you buy whatever it is that you want okay. or whatever. We provide an all inclusive experience in terms of the, the food and beverage type of deal. Um, and the dabbing and all of that, that is included in the ticket price. And then, again, like I said, it's uh, then the membership is just on a subscription basis later on. But right now it's free. Talk a little bit about the reaction. I mean, what kind of reaction are you getting back from people? What are, what are, what are oh, the comments man. that you're getting? Oh, my God. I mean. And get, do you have a diverse crowd? Is it the same absolutely. 50 people at every single event? No, not at all. Uh, so the first question, um, yeah, people love us, man. Like, Every single time it's it's a new experience for someone, um, they walk up to us personally and they say, I had this surpassed my expectations. I had no idea what to expect because no one in their right, no one in their, no one in their life has ever experienced what we do until they experience it. And no matter how much their friends tell them how cool it was, even if they have, you know, look, look on Instagram, look at how cool the split party was. They're not even going to get it until they mm -hmm. go. And so to answer your second question, it's a beautiful mix of our current members and bringing guests because the way that we do it is members can buy tickets, but they can buy tickets for their guests as well. As long as the member and the guests all show up together mm -hmm. and that they're not just willy nilly checking in like, oh, I'm with so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so is not here yet. 
all the members, the members have to come with their party. And what that does is that it creates more potential members every time. Got it. So the word starts spreading like wildfire now, Montel, uh, you know, after a, a year and a half, almost two years of us doing these events, we're, everybody's, everybody wants to, uh, let me not say everybody wants to come, but. Uh, what, what, we've, kind of, we've, what, what kind of numbers are you talking about? I mean, how many people, how many members do you have now? Currently, we're approaching 2,000 members. Okay. Uh, and this has been since we rolled that out this January. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, I mean, literally every single day there's membership approvals going on through, you know, my back end uh, where we verify and whatnot. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's just constantly growing. We're very, very happy about that. What's, your, what's been the, the biggest, you know, hurdle to overcome? I mean, finding locations? There are three hurdles. Finding locations has been a hurdle, but we're now easier. It's easier for us to navigate because now venue owners come to us sometimes, you know, and then other times when we approach them again, we, we just tell them like, look, we're experienced. Just check us out. Like we're not whatever it is that you have in your mind. Look at what we're doing. And I bet you you'll change that. Um, so that's not that much of a challenge. The biggest challenge that we have, obviously, is that we still have to be very discreet, that we cannot go 100 percent public with this, that we cannot go all over, you know, saying, you know, um, that's the biggest challenge, that we're still limited to how much we can expand at the current time. But we're still riding that way very nicely. I mean, we don't want to go too much too soon either. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, do you have to find, you find yourself having to change venues and move it around, move it around? Sure, different locations? sure, sure. The thing, the way that we structured it now is that we would ho- we would choose a location for Speakeasy, and then we would choose a location for High Tea, and we would only do it at that location for that season, and then we change it around again. Okay. And then we and then why we're changing around is for that reason, but it's also for the thought of the guest, right? You don't want to just always go to the same place. It's going to start becoming monotonous and you're going to lose interest as soon as another guy has another party. Sure. So, we do that to keep our guests interested. We also do it because we have to upgrade our locations. We started with lofts, now we're in restaurants, later on we'll be in hotel rooftops, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? So, it's just it's also because we are able to provide a better experience so we take that opportunity and provide that for the guests to further that interest and keep growing and you have entertainment at them absolutely lectures and seminars what do you do? we uh yes so at speakeasy and high tea we have entertainment uh we would always bring in a local artist uh band and a, an artist artist a visual artist so we would always have a live art piece and that we every single event would be a different entertainer. So that's one thing that will always change at every single event. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the vendors that we bring in are also different. And these are ve- the thing that we do with our vendors is also very curated because, like I said, I did not like it when with the sessions when everybody was selling the same thing. So mm-hmm. it's like you have your own brand, you have this one product, you sell this product. If you're Bud, you're going to be the only Bud collect- Bud vendor and, and you're the only selling Bud. And then if you're vapes, you're the only vape person and you're only selling vapes and this is your product and Mm -hmm. your edibles and so, you know, it's, it's all curated experience and that's what keeps uh, our guests entertained and wanting to come back for more and seeing what we got next. Gotcha. Age limit? 21. 21 and over? Yes. Older. And is this, this is an opportunity to get more and more people behind the idea of adult use? Correct. To see if they can be... You know, put the pressure on legislators to pass that? Absolutely. And again, it is also our mission to further get this idea into people's heads to eliminate, to replace uh, THC, replace alcohol with THC in the same settings that alcohol would be consumed in regular places. Mm-hmm. Because the vibe, whenever you come into our, our, our parties, the vibe is very different from what you would expect. Because you don't see everyone smoking, but everyone in the room is high. And there's a lot of people who are high and no one is drunk. So no one is loud. No one is belligerent. No one is saying stupid stuff. No mm-hmm. one, no one's aggressive. No one gets sick. No one is overly going to the bathroom. No one's making a mess. No one. It is a beautiful, beautiful environment. And because you're high with all of these people, you feel less shy to engage with someone. Right. Because they're cool. You know they're cool because they're doing exactly what you're doing. Wow. And that that's what connects people too. So we we really established a community and a new culture here. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we're continuing to do. From a demographic standpoint, is this something that, you know, and again, you know, could could a single woman feel safe to come out to an event like this? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, there, there was a publication by uh, Honeysuckle Magazine where it was a female journalist who came and quoted her on that and saying that I can, you know, this is the first time in a while that as a single woman coming on my own to an event like this, I felt comfortable and at home. Uh, and that spoke volumes mm -hmm. to us. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is not just a place for a single woman to come and feel uh, uh, welcome. It's for all to come and feel welcome. The demographic of our members is expansive. There's mm -hmm. all kinds of of people from all walks of life, all ages, all ethnicities, exactly how the New York demographic is supposed to be represented. Yeah, I, I just find it, you know, it, I'm amazed that that you operate under the radar, in a sense. Well, you know... When or, it, on the, <laughs> or on the radar, but, you know, the radar gets turned off. Mm. Yes, and, you know, we are, as we are growing and we are becoming more public, we are also increasing our security and mitigating our risks as much as we can. Um, we know that what we're doing is a risk. We're not saying that this is, you know, like we're completely protected and that we're boasting about the fact that we're doing this, ha ha, and no one else. No, we're doing this because we know that this means so much to us that we're willing to, you know, do what we have to do to put this in as many people's hands as possible, not to make a buck, mm -hmm. but to educate and right. to change a culture. That is our purpose. If it was to make a buck, we would have done it the right way and would have really made a whole lot of money if we, you know, say, moved to Cali or Colorado or Washington or whatever. And you know what? Even people over there are telling us that they haven't even seen what we do here over there. Oh, I, that's an ab mind. absolutely true. I I don't believe that I've seen a service like this in any of the recreational states. And They're, that's probably because of the, all of the regulations that exist in all of those states. People in this in those states are even more scared than the people in states where it hasn't even passed yet because of they they know that they had to pay a lot of money for these licenses and they have a lot of uh, uh, officials like looking at them under a microscope to make sure that they're following every single rule. But I guess I, but I, but I, I don't understand why in places where there is rec, you can't, I mean, if I, if I can consume right. a product in my private home, why right. could I then not have an event in my private home right. you, with other like-minded people? No, that you actually can do. So those are the only events that actually happen are private, private events. So the law right now, and I'm not 100% knowledgeable of the laws in every single state, but say for California, for example, you can either do it privately in your own home or you can do it publicly, but you cannot sell tickets, you cannot sell anything there. So what ends up happening is that these event organizers have to charge crazy uh, uh, sponsorship uh, packages and fees to other brands for them to get onto this so that they would be able to pull on this event. Got it. You know, we took on sponsors for the first time with our biggest event just two month, two weeks ago called Summer Soiree, which is unlike Speakeasy, High Tea, or Spleef and Chill, or Spleef Lab, which I didn't even mention yet. Um, because Soiree, this one was completely out in the open. We had people smoking uh, and va vaping and dabbing outdoors while, you know, uh, only the consumption of, you know, you know, drinking something or eating it or all of the entertainment and stuff were inside. People were out there, out in the public, not completely out in the public, but it was open to the public. Anybody was able to just walk past this and see what was going on. And yeah, we did it. And it didn't bother anybody. Mm -hmm. So, um, And you were doing that on private property or doing that on public property? Uh, it's hard to say hard these to days. Say. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. But the um, fact of the matter is that the venue owner, of course, never experiencing something like this was very, very you know, alert and he had his own security people. I was, I was just chuckling to myself. I was mm -hmm. like, look, man, he just doesn't know. Like this is, this is very open and people don't really understand how open it really, really, really is in New York city right mm -hmm. now.
Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Yeah, they, you know, all you have to do is take a walk down the street. Right, right. Every, every corner, you'll understand how open right, it is. Right, right. But to, to furthermore, uh, in rec states, you know, mm-hmm. uh, why what we do isn't really allowed is because consumption on site is not a thing that's legal yet anywhere. You can't go to a dispensary and consume. You can't go to a place Very where... Few. Yeah. So there are consumption lounges that now exist where you can actually go and consume your own stuff, but you can't mm-hmm. buy it there. Right. So, Except for in San Francisco, like in the San Francisco Bay Area, there are a few dispensaries that were grandfathered in that allow mm, for consumption on location. I see. There's a couple of them. I've, I've literally held some events in uh, San Francisco Bay Area um, where you could literally come in and sample a product mm. right there on the spot. Mm. And also have dab bars. In wow. A couple of the, but those are few and far between. Right. And they are grandfathered in via. Right, that, right. Yes. So, like, good luck trying to do that now, right? Sure. So, you know, who knows what it's going to be like in New York when, when the events, you know, the events category in particular, you know, like mm-hmm. we know the categories of, of marijuana industry, basically, you're either a cultivator, uh, a retailer, a uh, caregiver, I think those mm-hmm. are licenses specifically in certain places, mm-hmm. um, but there aren't specific licenses for cannabis events. catering, cannabis events, like mm-hmm. being able to put on events where people are consuming and that you're putting on this whole thing. Where, where do you see the future of what you're doing? You think it's going to turn into that where they will come up with a license that allows you to do just that? I absolutely believe so. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, the lawmakers just need to, you know, it's all one step at a time. And there's a lot of hands in the pot. But I think that eventually once they figure that out, they will start looking into this and they will start looking into consumption on site as well. And that they will understand that consumption does not necessarily mean smoking because right. smoking in a public place, no matter what you're smoking, can still make other people uncomfortable, even if they smoke weed too. Right. Because if I'm not smoking right now and there's like five people right next to me that are, uh, two things that are going to piss me off. One, why am I not smoking with them? Right. <laughs> and two, it's like there's just smoke and, and right. you know what I mean? Sure. Like I don't like that. So there's other ways to consume. People need to see that. Right. And especially the drinkable way, because the drinkable high is completely different from an edible high. People get scared of the edible consumption on site, sure. too, because they don't know what's going to happen to people. They're going to eat something edible, and then they're going to get way too high, and then they're going to get sick, and that's a liability. But with drinking cannabis, I found, Montel, is that, number one, you're able to microdose. Number two, you the effects that you feel are almost instantaneous, right. that uh, you're you're really able to gauge the experience. You always feel just good. Like, it just makes... Your day. Well, let me better. see what other products you have. Yeah, absolutely. So well, uh, my viewers can take a peek. Here's uh, our brand new product. It's an infused seltzer, um, and it's got a perfect little dose for one person to consume, or 35, you can thirty-five milligrams. milligrams is the total, total, is the total bottle. bottle. Yes, yeah. we recommend uh, you know half of that for one person to try out. But sure. you can you know, and an avid user who's who's tried this a couple of times, or consumer rather, sure, not um, the bottle. <laughs> right, right. And we specifically write non-alcoholic on the label right. to uh, to make sure that people know that. And our little bio on the side of the label is also really important. Uh, the other side. Well, that's directions, sure. which is important, the, mm-hmm. the education. But our bio, too, that we are purveyors uh, uh, in, this, in the scene that are really trying to change the way uh, mm-hmm. people look at social lubricants and that Absolutely. alcohol doesn't have to be the only one. Interesting term that you use. Did you coin that? Did you, uh, you guys... Uh, uh, what, social lubricant? That? Social lubricant? No, no. Yeah. Well, I mean, I wish I could, yeah, but I've definitely sure. heard this before. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, this is just one of the innovative products that we have uh, available and... There it is. And if you're out of state and you wanted to be a participant, let's say, you know, somebody's in California right now, somebody's sure. in Oregon, Utah, the, sure. in Nevada. Right. They want to reach out and say, look, I'm coming to New York in a couple of weeks. You got anything going on? Right. What do they do? Where do they go? They go, what they website? Go on, they go on spleefnyc.com. Uh, that's our homepage to go directly to our registration page at spleefnyc.com slash new members, uh, where you will just fill out your registration form, send us a, a unique uh, verification photo that lets us know who you are and that we're able to match that to your social media and geolocation. And uh, and then, yeah, then you're approved. We have a whole calendar of events that we already wrote, so you'll know when we have an event. I think, let me let me ask my producer, but we can put that calendar event up during this uh, uh, podcast, can we not? 
Okay, yeah. So we'll make sure that, you know, if you give us sure, absolutely. the list of the events that you have coming up in the next couple of months, we'll make sure that we tie that together with this podcast. That's beautiful. So that people at home, people who are listening, tuning in, want more information and want to know where they can go and just chill. Chill. When they get to New York, boom. I'd like That's to have it. sense of people your way. That's it. That's it. And, uh, I mean, we'd love to see you guys at one of these parties as well. Absolutely. So that you can really see for yourself, you know, like you'll feel the vibe and you'll automatically know that you're in a cool place. Well, I think organizations like yours would kind of, you know, one of the things that I'm really, really, really focused on is trying to get as much education out there as possible mm -hmm. to people who are consuming. And I, and I feel that, you know, this whole idea of recreational use or adult use versus medical use, I think at the end of the day, almost everybody using cannabis in, in making a choice of cannabis over alcohol or other social lubricants, technically my perspective is that you're doing so for a reason that may have a little medical benefit Absolutely. under it anyway. Absolutely. Everybody, every yes. single one of them, whether, whether you just need to use this to relax right. and it's the only thing that helps you relax. I mm -hmm. think that's what's there. And I'd love to be able to, to you know, use a forum like yours, maybe show up at one of your events where you have more people at them yeah. to, to do a little educational session. Maybe I could be, you know, the entertainment for the night, <laughs> just in a, a quick 20 minute speech to, 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 enter, to educate. Yeah. We'd love to have that. Yes, we, there's always a platform for education at our events, um, and yeah, the sky's the limit. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Mark, for being here, man. And, Thank you, know, you Montel. Tell your partner I'm sorry I missed him. Oh. Maybe he'll make the next one. Hey. You know, I, I'm going to be back in New York in a couple of weeks, and when I come back, I'll probably will do some more podcasts. So I'd love to have you guys back on again. Likewise, you're Absolutely. you live in Florida, right? I live in Miami. Yes, sir. Right on. Absolutely. Right on. What's the scene like down there, anyway? You know, it's weird. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah. it's strange because you know the state's still fighting over the administrative process mm -hmm. by which they're going to roll out the now voted in medical and, uh, you know, adult use program they have. Right. They haven't figured it out completely yet. So they're, they're working on it. Well, that's good. Absolutely. As long as there's some kind of progress being made. Uh, the progress is that no matter what street corner you walk on, you know, you know that it's there. <laughs> good. <Absolutely>. Well, <laughs> Any progress is good progress. Any progress is good progress. Thanks so much. And I'm I'm out of time for this edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. But I got to say again, thank you so much for Spleef NYC for being a part of the day. And, you know, tune in when you want to get some information. And I'd also love for you to, you know, give me your critique. Let me know what you think about the podcast and make sure you share it with others. We're going to put the information up on Spleef's NYC's schedule of events coming up in the next couple of months. So make sure you tune in.